This is a Pyramid One International Network presentation. Hi, and welcome to Pyramid One World Radio. Let me tell you about the host that's coming up. His name is Dr. Randall George Nozawa. Dr. Nozawa is living proof that a person can do everything right only to suffer horrific events that stymied decades of hard work and left him blind. The two most gruesome tragedies he suffered would make the fire-breathing Godzilla buckle in bitterness. Not Nozawa. He's grateful just to be alive. Nozawa had played high school football in Honolulu and later became a professional bodybuilder. When he moved to Washington, the muscle-bound Nozawa enrolled at the University of Washington's dental school, studied hard, and faithfully graduated. Yet, years later, after the opening of a handful of dental clinics, when he could finally afford the lifestyle he had always wanted, a tree came crashing down and foiled all his best laid plans. The second was when Dr. Nozawa was caught in the middle of a couple's domestic violence incident one fateful night. His neighbor first shot his wife dead, then shot Nozawa in the head from 12 inches away before finally shooting himself. Two tragic events that would change his life forever. You may call it tragedy. The doctor said, misfortune is just disguised as an opportunity. I say spirit has a plan for everyone from the beginning. And Dr. Nozawa's plan has just began. Missing both eyes now, Nozawa has to get used to moving about indoors and out. Shortly after the shooting and recovery, he realized that he desperately needed help learning to navigate. So he signed up for Washington State's Department of Services for the Blind, which took 10 months to be committed to. In his words, the doctor says, dreams do really come true but you have to believe it before you can see it. He said he has made his own dreams come true by helping others pursue their life aspirations. In his free 14 page book, Precipice of Potential, which can be downloaded from his website at www.drrandallgeorge.com. Nozoa asks, provocative questions to help readers examine their own lives more closely. Like, what do you do that fills you with joy and excitement? When is the last time that you gave something, anything, freely without expecting or wanting anything in return? What your last $20. Certainly food for thought. Dr. Randall Nozawa agrees with me that we are all family and our conscious selves are and have been since the beginning. A place where love, yes, love is the most important thing in our lives. And I am is a term which means Self-love is a human trait that makes us all whole with the universe. It's my honor to introduce to you, to the universe, your host tonight, Mr. Randall George Nazawa. Oh, yeah, he is there. He is there. <laughs> he is there. <laughs> Doctor, how are you today? 
<laughs> well, well, as you can tell, taller and better looking. So you know th this stuff works. I, you know, I'll tell you something. You know, with all the weather and everything else that's going around, I mean, it's warm down here in Florida. It's snowing up in, uh, you know, up in past Denver, or something. It's freezing in Alaska. I mean, what's going on around here? Plus, no. in the Dakotas, somebody said yesterday it was eighty degrees. I was like, what? I mean, come on. Yeah, but this is going to psychologically is going to adjust a lot of people in this country. <laughs> I mean, no, 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 it really is. And uh, just before we got on here, I I uh, read something from. Uh, uh, that uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, newsletter with his ch children's health defense. And I guess, darn, you know, with all this uh, vaccinations happening up in uh, in uh, Michigan, 246 have died because of that. Or, or, or uh, you know, they're, they're ill. Three have died. And uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm waiting for the good news, but doesn't seem to be any on that aspect. And, and that's why, you know, this... Uh, uh, today's show is so important because uh, we have a great guy here, Sylvester Boyd, and uh, I, I like uh, people's backgrounds, as you know, because we all tell a story while we're here on Earth, and uh, you know that that story uh, resonates with a lot of folks. Sometimes uh, intentionally, sometimes not. Sometimes you may not even meet those people that uh, know you or know what what you do, but uh, your individuality, your uniqueness has a profound influence over over people and uh, like you said what's the wonderful thing about this show is you know we try to connect folks and i like to introduce leaders to our community people that they've never heard of but are leaders nonetheless and we need more of them because if we can have more leaders and less politicians i'd be you know much happier <laughs> and <laughs> but uh you know that that, that that that's me because uh uh, when we start looking out for other folks and, you know, doing the best we can do, you know, to improve ourselves, to share that improvement and to include and understand others, uh, you know, a lot of our, our problems will, will go away. And so so that's why uh, when I, I looked up uh, the Sylvester Boyd, uh, you know, bio, it just it was just fascinating to me because this is a guy that has so many life experiences. Uh, not only internationally, but uh, you know, on the, you know the, the our local scene and in Hollywood. So uh, just with, uh, I don't know, sharing his life with others and all his uniqueness and all his talents, you know, I think just makes us a, a better place to live. And we we need more more, more people like this. And uh, so I'm just grateful to have a show like this to showcase uh, leaders in our community, which we we all can learn from. And and darn it, we, I think we just need uh, you know more leadership and and, and not from politicians. So, uh, Sylvester, welcome and thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> anyway, can, can you uh, you know take some time and review your history from your earliest remembrances to uh, you know how you grew up and and uh, you know what influenced you you know perhaps back then and why you do what you do now. Well, my earliest influences were a family. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have a strong family. And that's something that a lot of people don't have this, these days. And uh, I wish everybody could have the extended family that I had. Uh, I just authored a book. Uh, as a matter of fact, I authored the third book. Just released the third book in a series called Road for Money. And that book was, I was able to write that because of my grandmother who I sit at the knee of uh, when I was a kid and listened to every word she said, and she would tell me stories about money in Mississippi, a place that I had never been. It fascinated me. And when I was a kid, I never thought that these words would come out in a book, but they have come out in several books at this point. Uh, I also listened to my aunt, who, who was my second mother. And they, my whole family was from money in Mississippi. Now, I don't know whether any of your listeners know anything about Monty, Mississippi. But Monty, Mississippi was the birthplace of the civil rights movement. The modern civil rights movement started uh, in Monty, Mississippi. Emmett Till, a young African-American boy, was uh, killed and thrown in the Tallahatchie River because they said he whistled at a white woman. Uh, that was in the Jim Crow South. Uh, Money is a small town on the Tallahatchie River, and all of my folks came from that town. I have never been there, uh, but uh, it's an interesting little whistle stop place. It's not bigger than if you breathe hard, you'll be on the other side of it. 
Uh, the people that raised me came from sharecropping. And I can remember my great grandfather who told me stories of he was born uh, a few years after the Civil War, really. And yeah, it goes, he went back to, he lived to be almost 100. So mm -hmm. in my family, have, they've been fortunate enough to have a lot of longevity. Uh, my grandmother lived to be about 90 years old. M on my dad and my mother's side, there's a lot of longevity. So that is something that uh, just runs in the family. To make a long story short, uh, my folks came from Mississippi and during the Great Migration. That's when African Americans not being treated just justly in the South uh, look for better territory to live in. Some of them went west, some of them went uh, went further north, some all went all the way to Canada. But uh, being a historian, I am a historian, uh, being and and being steeped in history. Uh, I kind of tell the personal stories of people who are part of history. Uh, one of the things that I always say is that most Americans are not educated in history. That's one of our biggest pitfalls, because if you really educate and have true knowledge, not false knowledge, but true knowledge, it will lead you to the right place. But false knowledge has no power but to lead you to a wrong place. Uh, I went, I've been fortunate to live in all types of communities. We, uh, I was a kid uh, in my, I say, nine, ten years old. I went to all African-American schools in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, my folks then moved to the projects of public housing on 22nd and State, and that was, a, I call it the little UN community. We had some of all races. It was Chinatown, so we had a lot of Asians. Some of my best friends were Asian. Uh, there were a lot of Italians. There were a little bit, it was sort of a periphery community where a lot of different communities came together. Uh, so I learned to live with many different types of racial groups, religious groups, uh, people who dressed a little different, and talked a little different tongue, uh, which was a great experience. My folks always wanting to better themselves uh, moved from the public housing. Now, here's here's a story. My, my stepfather and my mother, my, my father and mother divorced when I was nine years old. Uh, my stepfather and my mother, wanting to better themselves, moved to Michigan in a little town called Allegan, Michigan, between uh, really between uh, Kalamazoo and uh, Detroit. And basically, they built a house we, every week they would buy a door, a window, some sand, some blocks, uh, uh, curtains, whatever it took for that house. When they moved into the house, they owned the house without a mortgage. And they also moved because they wanted to, us to not be exposed to some of the violent type things that were happening in the city, a big city. They wanted us not exposed. They had 40 acres of land, so I got a chance to be in the country. Uh, the high school that I went to was 95% white. So here in my background, I have had all African-American. I have had a mixed experience. And I've also had an experience of living with all white, mostly Caucasian. That's something that most people never get. It was, it was a unique gift that was given to me. That allowed me to understand how different people operate in the world, how we see the world. I'll give you an example. In 1957, that was, a, I think, historically, that was the year that uh, they did Brown versus the Board of Education, where schools were integrated. So uh, that historically was at the point that we moved to Michigan in, in, in 1959, just a couple of years after Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, that uh, gives you a time point. But when I went to Allegan High School, you know, my people were saying, well, I don't know how you're going to get along. And, you know, people in the city, my aunt and some of the other people were saying, I don't know how this is going to work out for you. You know, you're going to be a predominantly white uh, a community. Will you be able to adjust to it with the kids? You know, I, why are you leaving? Just stay here in the city and maybe move to a suburban community. But anyway, my folks moved. They had a nice house that was built by my stepfather. And he showed me how to build a house. So I, I was able to build a house. I mean, I had an example. He was a strong man. 
And uh, that was passed down to me. Uh, but anyway, they moved to mi Michigan. I went to Allegan High School, and to this day, I would be saying that I never was called out of my name. I was on the track team. Uh, I was the basketball my student manager of the basketball team, uh, and I got along with my classmates. And we, I'm, I'm a little older than you may think. I'm 77 years old, and I'll be coming up on my. I've been to many class reunions, and it's just like you know. It, it it's like a Norman Rockwell situation, and you would think, given just what you would think would be in the air, a lot of prejudice, a lot of uh, name calling, a lot of fights, a lot, none of that. Uh, now, I don't know why I was given that gift, but that was the gift I was given. Uh, so you can't always predict what will happen by what circumstances it's in. Uh, I love all my classmates to this very day. I think I had one of the best uh, groups of classmates. My my team, my high school team, went down state in basketball and lost in the state championship the year after I left. We won most of all the games when I was there. Uh, Friday night, we went on uh, hay rides and uh, taffy apples and cider and donuts and all, you know, Norman Rock, a small town, Allegan, small town. But that showed me that don't form opinions about anything or anybody before you see what's real. Because most times we get a false opinion of things, make a decision about things before we really know what it is. I didn't go to, to Michigan with an attitude that, you know, I came from the city and most of the folks I had been with were people of color. But now I'm, I'm in a high school and I adjusted, I think, very well to my classmates and they adjusted very well to me. Uh, so that's one thing that I did. And another thing that I've done in my life was um, my folks were uh, in the city. I, I went to college. I graduated from Chicago State University. Uh, so that, I came back to the city of Chicago after I graduated high school. And uh, I was hired as one of the first crew chiefs for American Airlines. And uh, crew chief, I don't know if you know what that is, that was the guy that was in charge, that was in charge of loading aircraft. And uh, my crew loaded one of the first 747s loaded O'Hare International Airport uh, uh, because we had the best record. They wanted the best, they wanted the crew that was the best on the ramp. And uh, we qualified for that. And so I had the experience of watching a big 747 take off and it gave me goosebumps that my crew loaded and got out on time. So in life, I was always taught by my folks, don't do it if you're not going to do it and be the best at it. That's the way I was taught. Uh, don't let anybody make tell you who you are. You know who you are. Be who you are at all times. That, that has led me through my life. And it's been, uh, I think, my grandmother. I think my mother. I think my stepfather. I think the folks that I stood on the shoulders of. But then I go back in history. Being a historian, I go back further. My great-grandfather and my grandfather and their folks and their life. And then I go back even further. I go back to the first African-American that landed on the shores here in America. And to, to the, the legacy that we have as a great people, a wonderful people, I will never let anybody tell me that we're not a magnificent people. When I look at my history, it is a, it is a magnificent history. Uh, it has been tried to, people have tried to take it from me. People have told lies about it. People have omitted me. But guess what? I know the truth. And when you know the truth, you feel pretty good about it. Uh, working at the airport, going back, I'm jumping around a little bit because I had a lot to say. Um, I had hot dog with Muhammad Ali. Uh, when you work at the airport, you see everybody. I saw uh, uh, Bob Hope. I actually shook hands with, with uh, Robert Kennedy. I loaded his aircraft, a uh, plane triple deuce going to Washington one night. He missed his uh, a, a flight to the government. They put him on a late flight because he had some kind of meeting or something. And when I did it, it was just shaking hands with Robert. He said, hi, and I said, hi, and kind of smiled at me and got on the airplane. But then later I found out I touched history. Uh, the folks that I've seen, you would be amazed at probably the people I've seen, most of the uh, movie stars of different eras. Everybody goes through an airport. So it was the crossroads of the world. Uh, 
getting away from that. I'm also I've also been an actor. I'm a background actor, and I'm uh, have been a featured background actor, and uh, I've acted on Chicago Fire, Chicago PD. I have been on uh, the just about most net networks, that television stations, ABC, NBC, um, Stars. It just that goes on. Uh, I actually bit, I don't know how many of you guests may have looked at Chicago Fire, Chicago PD. Sometimes you look up, you see me in the background. I'm not a foreground actor, but I am an on camera actor, which means that the big stars like Taraji P. Hinton and Terrence Howard and Forrest Whitaker, uh, Gina King. I have acted in movies or TV shows with all of those people and many, many more. I'm not going to bore you with that. So, life lead you where you think you want to go if you put in the time and experience. It, it's not like uh, life is a bed of roses. It don't happen that way. I, I've never seen anybody say they never had a problem because I always felt that my grandmother told me, uh, hey, you got tear ducts because God knew you were going to cry and you got muscles to, to, to uh, smile with because he knew you were going to laugh. And that's true when you think about it. So, you know, basically, I had a, a life when I look back, if I went today, I could say, hey, sometimes I'm amazed at the things that have happened. But I've been put in places and done things that I only dreamed about. I've been a world traveler. Matter of fact, just before the pandemic, I just got back from Cuba. I've been to Denmark, uh, been to Norway, Belize, St. Thomas. Saint, you know, I, I've traveled the world. Let's put it that way. Uh, Canada, I mean, just I'm not going to enumerate all the places I've been. But by traveling the world, I learn, learn what the world really is. I mean, I'm a citizen of the world. Yeah, I live in the United States, but the United States is just one country amongst many in this world. And uh, I taught school. So here's another thing that I've done. Um, I taught uh, as a substitute teacher and for five years on the, on the west side of Chicago because they asked me, what did I want to teach? And I said, I want to teach in the roughest neighborhood you got. Because I think people need to see it to be it. And I had some experiences that I thought I could impart on the children. And uh, for five years, I did that. So, uh, you know, life is what I was always, uh, my mother always told me, life don't owe you nothing. You got to go get it. You know, it's not a where it comes to you. You got to go to it if you want to get it. And so uh, maybe some things happen that give you a break. I got to be an actor, believe it or not, walking down the street. And uh, in Chicago, I was one day walking down the street. I lived downtown. And there was a gentleman. He's, he was passing out flyers and says, hey, you need to be in the movies. And the first thing that occurred to me, a negative thought, this guy's some kind of crackpot. You know, well, you know, he's out here passing out stuff, talking about being in the movie. So that was a negative thought. But he gave me the flyer. I looked at it. And I, I came home. And I thought about it. I said, well, I ain't got nothing to do tomorrow. I think I'll, it was way up on the north side and uh, about a 10-minute drive from where I live. And I said, I think I'll go and do this. But the heck, I'm probably just a waste of time. And so I drove up to the studio on the address that they gave me. And, man, it was people for days. I said, oh, yeah, I got a real good chance of doing this. You know, there were every kind of person you could imagine. There were old people, young people, fat people, skinny people, black people, white people, just any men, women. Just And I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get this, but I'll go ahead and fill out the paperwork. I walked in, they just handed everybody paperwork, filled it out, came home, stopped on the way, got me a little lunch as well. At least I had a nice ride and a nice lunch. Make a long story short, two weeks later, later the phone rang. It was the casting company. Are you Sylvester Boyd? I said, yes. They say, uh, we have cast you as a security guard in, in, a, in the motion picture, The Dilemma. And you can probably rent that now. I mean, it's a major motion picture. It was with Vince Vaughn, Renona Ryder, Jennifer Conley, some of the biggest people in Hollywood. Now, had I made, it's, life is like a bunch of decisions. We make decisions every day. Had I not uh, looked at the paper, do it in a trash can, I would have never been a background actor. It's just that flimsy, just as thin as a piece of paper. And I tell people, you know, you got to take opportunities when an opportunity are presented. 
And, uh, you know, sometimes you just got to go on, on faith and what you feel in your gut. And that's what I did. I said, I'm going to go up here and see about it. And I've done this for about 10 years now, 11, going on 11 years now. Uh, and I've been, like I said, with some of the biggest actors in Hollywood. You name it, I've probably been right there with them. I got pictures to prove it. Uh, the thing that I feel that we as a as a nation don't do is get to know one another. We don't know one another. People have form opinions, and you know, how can I f- form an opinion about an Asian person if I never? lived near one, seen one, or been with one, okay? Same thing. How can I uh, form an opinion about a, a Mexican person or a Spanish person? I don't live with them. I don't know. So somebody says, oh, those Mexicans, those black people, those Chinese people. Those, no, those are members of my family, the extended human family. And, uh, you know, I wish a lot of people would think like that, but we seem to be concentrating on how different we are and not how much alike we are. Because I have never seen anybody that has, don't have a skin on their body that, that, that has a color. All skin has a flesh tone, but it, it ranges from dark to light. But it's the first tone. I've never seen any clear person that I could see right through from one side to the other. Don't happen. Never saw them. If, if you show me that, I'll say this person is different from me. This person may be superior because you can see through them and I can't see through anybody else. But until you do that, I have no reason to think you're superior to me. Uh, my history tells me that, no, I'm, there's no superiority here. There's just one human having advantages or disadvantages that the other human being did not have. Uh, If I hit the lottery tomorrow at two o'clock for $20 million and I was the worst person in the world, would that money make me a better person? No. I would be the same person with money and probably could do more harm than good because if I was evil, I could do more evil with the money. So those are the kinds of things that, that in my life I think about. Uh, the things that money can't buy, because America is a very materialistic country, and we've been blessed. Uh, any, I always say, any group of people who who are part of this continent, the North American continent, we're blessed from the beginning. The American Indian, we're blessed. We got rivers and lakes and streams and mountains, and you know, we got we got it all. And we were protected a lot from wars, in some ways, major wars, because we had oceans between us. That that was in the past, not now. But those we as Americans have been totally blessed. Now, why we separate and do things to one another that we do, that that's that's a, a real sixty-four million dollar question. Uh, I think a lot of it. Uh, I I think of the things that money can't buy. Money can't buy your manners. You know, if you're ill-mannered, you're just an ill-mannered person. It can't buy your respect. Uh, a person may say they respect you because you have a certain amount of money, but that's false respect. It's not real respect. Money can't buy that. Morals. If I'm an immoral person, I don't care how much money I got, I'm still an immoral person. Character. Who are who? Who are you? It comes from inside. Money can't buy that. It's something that you build inside of yourself and the things that you do. Common sense, which we have lost most of our common sense, I think, in this day and age. Uh, money can't buy common sense. My grandmother used to call it mother will. Money can't buy your trust. You know, you, you trust a person or you don't trust a person, but money cannot buy it. Okay. It can't buy your patience, which is something that I found out during this pandemic that we don't have very much patience. We want to do it because we want to do it. It's Christmas. I'm going to see grandma and granddad and my cousins and my uncles. But if somebody gets killed, it's all right. If somebody gets very sick, that's all right. That's a, I can't figure that out. But that's patient. Being patient enough to work, to wait until such time the things are cleared up, to having that patience. We don't have it. And character comes with that. And some of these other ones kind of, you know, kind of tear dovetail on each other. Class. Are you do you have class as a person? You know, 
So the, that's the kind integrity. Now you're a person that lies, te- steals, cheats, or do you have integrity? So when you say you're going to do something, you get it done. You tell me you're going to be somewhere. You, you're there. That's integrity. And, and definitely can't buy you love. Somebody could tell you they love you, but it's not true love. You know, these things money just can't buy. And I think more and more and more people need to look at those. Those are some of the virtues that I learned. And I know them by heart, verbatim. Money can't buy your life. If you got a billion dollars and the doctor tells you you're gone, you're gone. I mean, you got a week to live and maybe that week runs out. You cannot buy another week. Impossible. So I go with what money can buy. And you guess what? The things that money can buy are some of the most powerful things in the world. Love is powerful. Money can't buy it, though. Patient, when you think about it, these are very respect. Uh, the thing that we wrestling with in this country is for its racial dynamic right now. Disrespect. If I don't love my wife I'll, and I disrespect my wife, if I respect my wife, I I, I won't hit her. I, I can't disrespect. Respect is a big one. Respect. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. The golden rule gives us the pattern that we need. To, I'm not a preacher, but I know doing to others, I want them to do unto me. And I think that would clear up. Whoa, would that clear up a lot? That would change the world tomorrow. This time It's a simple phrase. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. I don't want to be lied to. So why should I lie to somebody else? So those types of things, you know, we would never have slavery in this country if we saw other people as human beings instead of uh, uh, someone to have labor exploited from. If we saw land as a place to live and to, to be in harmony with, like the American Indians, who I studied deeply, they had a philosophy that was in harmony with planet Earth. Um, we do not. We got a situation in Florida right now where they're worried about some kind of contamination of the ocean, but not in harmony with, with nature. Everything is connected to the next thing. There's nothing on earth that is not connected to the next thing. You may think it isn't, but everything's connected. It don't, maybe it doesn't appear to be connected. Uh, the food that you eat has to be connected to the grass that, that's grown. The air that you breathe, if it contains too much of certain things, you get sick. It's as simple as that. You have to be the water you drink, if it's got lead in it, it messes with the brain. So you have to be in harmony. I feel that I try to be in harmony with the universe that I live in. Uh, I think about it. I, I recycle my garbage. And it takes a little more time. So what? Uh, some things that I think should be done that not only talk about problems, but have solutions for them. Uh, why do we not have a deposit on every pop bottle in America, every can in America? People will respond to being charged 10 cents more for a can. They'll collect them, take them back, and you can recycle them. Why don't we do that? No, we throw them in the creeks and rivers and streams. Uh, the ocean's full of trash. Uh, you know, me being able to fly over the ocean and see what it looks like, I've been fortunate. A lot of people can't do that, but you can take care and make sure your neighborhood is clean, the sidewalk in front of your house. Don't throw paper and contaminate the ground around you. Uh, when I taught school at, at 5 o'clock, um, at 3 o'clock, excuse me, when the kids were ready to go and everybody was ready to go and I'd look around the room and uh, I'd see paper on the floor or I'd see racers and crayons or whatever it was for the older people, books or whatever. I said, well, we won't be here. We're going to be here a little while longer. Well, why are you doing that? Well, why can't we go? We're ready to go. Let's go. I said, well, when the room is clean, we'll go. If you got paper, I want every piece of paper up off this floor before you walk out the door. We got janitors for that. I said, no, you don't have janitors for that. You learn it. Would you throw that? Would, should I say that your house would look like this? Well, why would you? Say? Then they would get, you know, but 
I thought that was a valuable lesson for them to have. Don't throw paper down. Keep your area that you live in and the neighborhood you live in clean. Not enough of us get that. Uh, one of the countries I have a lot of respect for is Canada. I went to Toronto and uh, I live in Chicago. Chicago is a great city, but it ain't the cleanest one in the world, I can tell you that. Uh, down, I live downtown, so it's a little cleaner, but, you know, people throw trash, you know, whatever it is when you get through with it, just throw it away. The lakefront's got cans and floating on the water and some of the other things that don't look too pleasant. But when I went to Toronto, I, I didn't see one piece of paper anywhere. The citizens there take care of their, their surroundings. It's as simple as that. It's the small thing that make a country work the way it should work. We have, we always say let's have more police officers on the street. More police officers don't make you safer, and we got to get away from that. We will one day figure that out. I figured it out a long time ago. What makes you safer is having jobs and employment for your citizens, having health care for your citizens. Making your citizens feel like they are part of the city or state of the country. That makes you safer. You know, people are more likely to stick someone up if they don't have a, a meal to eat. So things really, if you really think about it, everything is connected to the next thing. If you don't care about me, why should I care about you? That's the street. That's what, that's what goes on on the street. We have more homicides than any country in the world, uh, especially in the Western world. We kill each other. It's a war. Why is that? Mass murder. People walk in and just shoot everybody. Why is that? That says something about the society that you live in. And that goes back to some of those manners, respect, morals, all those things that I was taught. Those Every kid should be taught that from a very early age. So when they get old enough to perpetrate time, they won't perpetrate it. When they get old enough to throw paper on the street, they won't do it. It's what's taught. And then some things that are taught purposely to keep one group down versus another group staying up. Some things are omitted. Uh, there's a lot of things that are omitted from history. I took a course called History's Omissions, and it, it was an eye-opener. I was able to see the things that weren't supposed to, I weren't supposed to see. You don't say a certain thing because you don't want other people to know a certain thing. It, it, slaves were not allowed to read and write. Why is that? Because they knew that they were human beings. Although we say, what is it, three-fourths of a human being? Who makes, I, I don't know how many gods we got. I haven't seen three-fourths of a human being. What would you take off the arm or the neck or the leg? I mean, there's no three-fourths walking around that I've seen. Uh, countries can be hypocritical. They, not just, they're not picking on America. I live in America. I love America. But the question is, does my country love me back the same way? That's the question. Not whether I'm dedicated to my country. It's whether my country is dedicated to me. Uh, give you an example. If and when we go to war, I think all races go. You know, we don't we don't discriminate too much about wars. But when you come back, can you have the standard? I'll give you an example. World War II, the Tuskegee Airmen. That was a, that's an African American group of pilots who weren't supposed to be able to fly airplanes in the first place. Black people were not able to do that. They, 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 their mental capacity didn't allow for that. But guess what? They had one of the most distinguished records in World War II. They never lost a bomber that they escorted. Not one bomber that they escorted. And they said, paint our tails red because we want them to know we're up here. Before they were up there, the bombers were getting chopped up. That gives me goosebumps. That's my folks up there flying around. So, you know, these are the things that, the, that inspire me, and they, they should be. And if you, here's another thing. If you don't know history, if you take my history away, you have to take it away from a white child or a Mexican child. I can't take a Mexican's history away and not take my history away. 
You can't do it. History is history. It's real. What you've done is what you've done. What you're doing is what you're doing. If I build a big, beautiful skyscraper, I built a big scooter skyscraper. You know, you say one thing and do another is hypocrisy. And we have a lot of hypocrisy in our country, but all countries. That's what lets me know when I travel the world, I'm able to see one country believes is a little different than I say Cuba, and Cuba's different than Puerto Rico. And people eat and and, and some of the customs are the same, but then we got we are all variations on the same thing. Every one of us. And all of us do the same thing. We are all born. We all live. We all die. It's no different. I haven't seen a human being yet that could. If you get out of that cycle and show me how you're going to live forever, boy, that's that's another one. Like that clear person I said walking around. Or the three-fourths of a human being. Clear people I didn't see. Three-fourths of a human being I never saw. You know, what, what's, what's real is what's real. I, I try to always be true to me. That's number one. Because if I can't be true to me, I can't be true to nobody else as a human being. And I think those lessons are not imparted on our children. Uh, and so you get one generation after another. We fight a civil war because of discrimination and using people's labor and all the things that we got in the civil war about free labor. And we come right back and now we have another hundred and some odd years forward. And we got the same type of divisiveness that caused the civil war. So we did not learn from those thousands and thousands of men that died on the battlefields at Appomattox and Sharpsville and Cole Harbor, Shiloh. You know, we didn't learn from that. So, you know, to know history is to know who you are. And our folks don't know it. I majored in history and geography. And God has blessed me to use both of my skills that I trained for to be able to to impart on other people. Now, I'm not going to live forever. I'm not going to hoard my knowledge. I'm trying to spread it as far as I can, as quick as I can. Because I know it'll be a day that my grandkids need that. My sons, my daughter will need that. They have already proven it. My daughter was an officer in the, in the Army. She traveled all over the world. When she was a little girl, she used to see me. She said, Dad, I'm going to travel more than you. I'm going to go further than you. And I would smile. I'd say, okay, prove it. Don't tell me. Do it. That's what my mother used to tell me. Don't tell me. Do it. She did it. I got a bachelor's degree. She has two master's degrees. She's been all over the world. So she she proved it. And, you know, I put my arms around her one day and smiled. And I said, you did it. But it made me... A, a, that, that let me know that some of the training, that things that she saw when she was raised in the family she was raised in, it came to fruition. She paid attention, and it paid off. And I got a grandson. Her, her, this is just one of my. I got four kids, but I'm just just I'm out of time for time's sake. Uh, my grandson is coming out of high school and he's already uh, taking college courses. And so when he goes into college, he'll be a sophomore. That's her son. Because I uh, family valued education. I have a nephew who has a PhD in biochemistry. He works for the United States Navy in Washington, D.C. So this is valuing uh, education. Because they used to, my family, they used to say, education is the key to the door. And if you ain't got the key, you can't get in. And that's the way we were trained. But that training, I could see it all through my family. Now, these people came from Mississippi, sharecroppers. And you think, I ain't proud of my folks? Boy, you got another thing coming. Because they did. My mother used to always say, don't tell me what you're going to do, do it. And I, I'll see it. She said, if you do something, people see what you do. If you don't do nothing, they also see that. If you're drunk, they see that. If you're a wine head, they see that. People see what you do and know you by what you do. Now, whether they like what you do as far as race or whatever else, that may infringe on somebody, but I never could understand why 
a Mexican person can't live next to me. No, they keep the house clean, the yard clean, and don't play the music like, hey, we got, hey, me and Jose got it going on. It's simple as that. Uh, Honolulu, I've been to Honolulu. The people there, mixed culture, it's because it's in the Pacific. I've been to o o Oahu, Pearl Harbor, Pearl City. And you, you find that when people treat each other right, things go right. When people treat each other or mistreat each other wrong, things go wrong. Why don't we have health care in America? That's another one. They got it in England. I've been to Denmark. They got it in Denmark. They got it in France. They got it in Canada. But we get this thing about health care. We can't do it. And I don't understand why we can't have health care for everyone. Because health care should be what? All right. Nobody, I've never seen somebody walk up and say, hey, I think I want a little pneumonia this morning. I think I want a little tuberculosis today. So how can you cheat the system? Because nobody wants to be sick. There's no, there's no, no case for not having the national health care insurance. Nobody can rip the system off with that. I think every person in this country who works and have a job, who doesn't have a job, who's on the street should have health care. It's just that simple. So, you know, life is pretty simple when you do the right thing. The, the things kind of fall in the right place. It's kind of funny that way. It's like kind of shaking the marbles up and they, if you throw them up real hard, you don't get it. But if you take your time and kind of ease them to the right groove, they'll all kind of fall right in the right place. It's kind of funny. That's just my philosophy of life. But as a person, I think the things that I've been able to do and the things I've been able to see just have been a, a tremendous to me. And like I said, I'm trying to give it to everybody that I see that I can give something to. Uh, when I taught school, uh, if you were in fifth grade and you couldn't tell me the capital of states, hey, you got hey, you fifth grade? What grade are you? Uh, what's the capital of Oregon? Salem. Say it right quick. When you say, ah, ah, no, you don't know. Because, and they say, well, how can you do that? I say, because when I was in school, I sit, sit my tail down and I listened to what the teacher had to say. Because I always figured the teacher knew more than me because they were a teacher. Some kids don't get that philosophy. When I was a teacher, I always sit in the back of the classroom. And kids say, why do you sit in the back of the classroom, Mr. Boy? I say, because I can see you, but you can't see me. Okay. So, you know, so when you, you, if you're misbehaving, I don't know. It. But there's little things that we do and treat everybody the same, you know, no matter where they come from, what race, what their religion is, what foods they eat, treat everybody the same. They're human beings. They're your brothers and sisters, your cousins, your uncles, because the human family, if you really get back in the history and you get back in the genetics, you'll find that we are all related all related and people don't want to hear that but hey that's the truth oh yeah oh yeah i think the doc, doc is ready to blow up i'm watching him. oh no i i could listen to you all day because i'm getting this uh, serotonin rush just listening to this guy <laughs> no because you know it's one uh, i love history and, and uh, as you know you know it's the whoever wins the wars and wins these conflicts write the history and we never get the true history when we go through school and of course, you know, money is never taught in school because, you know, that that's a, a thing in itself with, with the globalists and uh, whoever, uh, you know, owns the world banks and all that. But, you know, just what you say is just uh, like I said, I can listen to this forever because one, if you ran for president, I would vote for you. Well, you no, would never no, win because, you know, no, you are one, you're, <laughs> you're honest and you've got uh, integrity, so you would never win. OK, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, they, they'd kick you out right away. One, <laughs> well, we already had a, a black president, but you know, uh, with you, uh, you you would uh, your uh, platform would be honest, uh, honesty and integrity, and uh, you, you know, unity, and uh, th that was not presented back when, and with uh, uh, no no other president. So, like I said, you'd have my vote, but you wouldn't win. 
because because you're okay. too honest. I'm glad I got but, you up. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, you know, and 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 so you know, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago we had a a, a lady on uh, uh, Deidre Riley, and we're talking about Christianity, and you know, she's uh, an author and uh, uh, you know expert at at Christianity. So, you know, what, what is uh, I don't quite understand all the religions because they. Uh, uh, you know, they, they have all these sets of rules, and I, I think based on love, of course, all of them, but all these rules to break, I go, you know, we're human beings, we break rules, and then we get punished for these, you know, uh, all these rules we break, but, you know, what you brought up was so important because it, it, it matched what she said. I said, you know, what is Christianity in your opinion? She goes, you know, it's uh, showing respect and showing love, you know, and feeling love for other folks, but you got, you got to respect everyone. I go, oh, okay, now I know what it is, and you just mentioned the same thing, and so, you know, it's not, not so much Christianity related, but uh, I think how uh, we need to integrate in our world, because yes, we all come from the same place, you know, uh, I, I'm into, uh, you know, anatomy, I, I'm into, uh, you know, physiology, and all the, the microbes in us, and, you know, uh, in our fossil record 3.5 billion years ago, uh, we have these things called archaea. Uh, uh, they're what's called the old ones, or that they're pre-bacteria, and then then came, uh, you know, the the, the genes, and, and then the the viruses, which uh, actually helped uh, 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 horizontal, you know, movement and creating all the species that we have on Earth now, and uh, it, it's just it's just interesting that that we're trying to kill viruses now, but. Uh, you know, and all of us right here, and and uh, just uh, because uh, <laughs> so enamored with you with your story here is that uh, we we have a gene in all of us, all human beings, uh, endogenous retrovirus uh, gene. We make viruses, we make fungus, we we make bacteria, we make parasites. So we make it all. Okay, can't we, we uh, uh, you can you can't live without bacteria and virus. Yeah, I mean, no, see exactly, and you know here we are. We want to kill them all, right? I say when when is when is it, there's an imbalance, you'll you'll get ill. So you know, quit the imbalance. You know, wash your hands here and there, and and you know, things like that. But if you wipe it all out, we will die. And here we are, our entire country, we're killing everything. I said, well, you know, just just take a step back here, you know. But what you bring is, uh, uh, you know, this. I, I think it's a way of thinking, Sylvester, because it's one of those, uh, you know, things that we've uh, a lot of us. Have lost our way. We've never been taught that way. We've been uh, taught that vi diversity is a bad thing. Diversity is what makes us uh, one, our, our species, as well as all the things on Earth, why we thrive. Diversity, and you know, it's not something to be hated or or uh, made fun of, or uh, pushed aside. That's what makes us, uh, you know, well, thrive here, on well, Earth. Here, uh, here, I don't interrupt you, but here is here's what I always say. We are all products of our environment. If I go to the North Pole, I see a polar bear, and his color is going to be white because he's adapted to his environment. A snow fox is white. Why? Because he would probably have no prey if he was a darker color and he would be against a, a white background. If you, it goes with wood, you could take wood. If I go to Canada, I'm get the lightest woods in the world. But if I go to the jungles of, of, of Senegal or, or the a Amazon, I'm going to get teaks and mohangamis, dark wood, environment. God made everybody to adapt to the environment they were in. But now we're in a modern age. We travel. We scramble up. It's nothing about how smart you are. It's nothing about how not smart you are and educated you are. It's about you adopted to the environment that you come from originally everything adapts if if we stay on planet earth another ten thousand years there'll be further adaptation uh my nose in uh, african-american nose you know we got kind of wide flat nast uh, nostrils uh europeans have narrow nostrils because why i need to take in more air and hot air is thinner so i need to take in more adapted to that climate okay but if you're in a in a, in a hot climate a cold climate you don't want to take in a lot of cold air to your lungs so now your nostrils are thinner your nasal passages are thinner adaptation to that simple is the answer you know an educated person can never be uh, don't think a little bit of themselves. They'll always think a lot 
of who, what they know because they know what they know, and it, it facts are facts. Um, that's be, the reason we have in America today the problems we have is the people are not educated. They're not educated. We say we are. I think, uh, what are we, about 20th on some of the scales of mathematics, China, a lot of countries are way ahead of us. We say USA, okay, and I love my country. Don't get me wrong. I love America. We don't want to be born anywhere else. But there's things in this country that need to be corrected, and they should have been corrected hundreds of years ago. And we're going we're gonna to have problems until we look in the mirror and see who we really are, not who we say we are. Saying is one thing, doing is another. And a country is the same as a person. I just got I alluded to that earlier that, you know, don't say it, do it. You, you, he, I always had a problem with, you know, all men are created equal and endowed with their creators by cert, with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and then you turn around and have slaves. That don't match to me. It just don't. <laughs> it's hypocrisy at its work. You know, so we, all through history, we are a very hypocritical country. We make differences where there shouldn't be differences. So hopefully we'll get to the point one day that we, as a people, look up and say, these are my brothers and sisters. And we all will, you know, I'm not trying to sing Kumbaya, but I think we don't have problems until we take that day. My book, all through my books, if you read, I got a series of books and it takes my family from 1917, my aunt, all the way to Chicago. She was she in a born a sharecropper. She ended up a millionaire in Chicago, on the South Side here in, in Chicago. And the stories in my book, that's what that follows her life. Uh, I got four, three books written, and the fourth one I just introduced. And they take you through different eras: World War II. They take you all the way back, all the way up to probably end up with hip hop and modern day. Uh, so, you know, I think people need to read about people who have not, they came in the world, they, had, they overcome a lot. I always was told, if life gives you lemon, you make you a big bowl of a cup of lemonade. Yeah. No, see, that's why I so wanted you on the show, because it's, uh, now that I learned more about you, it's, uh, you know, more people need to know, you know, about you, you know, personally and, and the message you have. Because, look, uh, you know, we, we all have our subconscious minds and our subconscious restrictions and our belief system. And once we all get stuck in a belief system or conviction, really hard to break because that becomes, uh, you know, the identity. And, you know, if someone asks, uh, well, where'd you get this identity? We, you know, we go, I don't know, <laughs> you know. And, and so what you bring is a, a look at the truth. And I think that's so important because, you know, just like you said, uh, you know, we humans, we're, we run on hypocrisy. Uh, and, and that's almost daily, you, you know, and uh, and uh, we never, you know, speak the truth. We never consider love as uh, universal. And uh, we're always looking at the differences as bad when uh, it, that makes us great. And so, you know, to get uh, you in front of uh, what well, your books plus you uh, out in front of more people, I think the better because you know, we're all stuck in our belief systems. And, you know, and that's why you see it in politics on which side you, you sit on. And, uh, you know, like what what news do you you watch? Is it, you know, Fox or MSNBC or or things like that? And uh, it, people pick sides, but but they never see all the, the greatness in us. Uh, you know, when uh, you, you look at all the similarities within the diversity, because, uh, you know, as, as far as humans go, uh, you know, we, we've uh, so-called evolved and for some not very much. But, uh, you know, we've evolved. <laughs> no, and it's really true because depending where you go, and you've seen more than I have, you go to different states, different countries, you know, uh, unlike how you grew up, uh, one, you're going to get called names, okay? And just because they don't even know who you are, but they go, oh, look at his skin color. You know, obviously, you know, he's this and this and this. And uh, so, so they're, they're, they're coming to judgment, criticism, condemnation without even knowing you. I was given, I was given the tools to handle that. Um, my my folks have always said, well, if somebody calls you names and they don't know you, they're ignorant. It's simple. So you put it where it belongs. You don't, you don't, they don't diminish you because you know who you are. Yeah. But if somebody calls you a name and they don't know you, they have no reason to call you that name, then you put that back to the where it comes from. That's ignorant people. Ignorant people do ignorant things. 
That's what no, I was taught. Ignorant no, people no, do it's ignorant. really true. And say, so, well, like what you've done, especially uh, you with your high school years, is that you, you met all these, uh, you know, different type of, uh, you know, folks, and you know, probably mainly Caucasoid, uh, you know, white. So they get to meet you, going, wow, this guy's a really cool guy. And so uh, what you've done is that uh, you've uh, allowed them to learn from you. And so that, that got spread to their families and their acquaintances. So, you know, it, it propagates like that. You know, it's kind of ripple effect because they know this one guy. And, and no, he's not a thug. You know, he doesn't like to steal things. He doesn't like to rape anybody. He, he's a really cool guy and he's really smart. You see, so that, that's what goes out there, and that's that's a story that gets spread. I think that's why we need more stories like this, and that's why I, I you know, I love my show here, is that I bring on people like you because you know you're, you're leaders, and I would like your message to, to meet more people because darn, you know, our, our our country, and like you said, uh, supposedly you know the greatest country in the world, you know, maybe uh, at, at one time financially, but not anymore. But uh, just like you were saying, it's the you know, especially with child uh, deaths and maternal deaths you know it's uh we have a very high rate and i go huh with the best medical system in the world all these babies and mothers are dying what is that about you see and so uh you know we need to you know get a handle on this but what what you bring uh is uh you know just knowledge and just say uh uh boy how do you put it into words is that you know you, you bring uh you know respect and love you know to the table most once we start doing that uh we are you know you know the same i mean i don't care who you are if you're human you, you get uh you get cut you you bleed red and that's what it is and you know we have all the same internal organs right and uh it's our belief systems that, that are all kind of screwy bit based on our geography and, and yes we adapt and uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, people don't uh, want to say that, you know, we, we all come from Africa or, or that country uh, or, or that piece of land way back then. But but yes, we do. And there are about three different migrations in and out of Africa. But, you know, as far as, you know, appearance goes, is that, uh, uh, you know, say your earliest ancestors, what did you do? You, you had to run uh, uh, fast or long distances to catch food. Then you got to drag it back to, to your clan. OK, and then you got to be out in the hot sun. And, and so the, thusly, you know, the skin, you know, type of a nose structure, you know, type of texture of hair, because that was the environment. Well, okay. then that, it also leads to the diseases. African-Americans have sickle cell uh, yes. and, and Europeans don't get sickle cell because there's a, it's the shape of the cell that was that was formed in Africa. But Europeans get uh, skin cancer at a much higher rate than African Americans. So it's just a matter of a, adaptation, what happens to you in the environment you live in, and uh, how you adapt in your body and your group adapts to what's around them. It's, it's nothing more than that. And uh, I think when we get, when you keep me back, you keep the country back. Every person that you hold back may have something to contribute that they don't. Someone, a little uh, a Mexican kid, could right now grow up to be the person that cures cancer. But if you hold that person back, your mother dies and you die from the cancer that you held. So it comes back around. There's no way of getting around it. What you reap, <laughs> you, you reap what you sow. That's what I, my grandmother used to always say. So, but she used to say, if you plant a crooked seed, you'll get a crooked plant which will produce crooked fruit. Okay. You know, doctor, what? doctor, yeah. we're, we're, we're at the end of the show, ah. but you know what? There's, there's so much here. Uh, yeah. Sylvester, if you know, I, if it's okay by Sylvester, we'd like to have him back. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, just, just let me know. I've, I've done interviews, yeah. uh, a lot of interviews. We can, oh, we, no, th th no, this is great. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I could talk to this guy forever. But like I said, my, I mean, this is a serotonin rush when I, when I listened to him. And I, I learned a lot. And like I said, uh, he's got my vote for president because we need a direction here. And we're kind of flopping around. But uh, yeah, so that's, thanks so much. And, yeah, if we can uh, arrange that, Bob, let's do it. Yeah, I was gonna say I was going to say, Sylvester, I mean, you and I are in the 70s air years. You yeah, know? I'm 77. I'm not ashamed I'm, of it. I've been good. <laughs> I, I got, I got, a, I got less than less than a month, and I'll be 70. Yep, but I know. the The thing is, the thing is, the part of our lives that we went through when we were kids, when we were younger, you know, 
the care feel, you know, carefree kind of thing in that the thing in that where you were free and you could do what you wanted to do and you could achieve what you wanted to do. I don't care what color you are or what where you came from or what your background is or anything else. Back then, it was pretty simple to do if, like your mother said, if you say you're going to do it, do it. And it was inside of us then. For some reason, in all those years, and we've been through them all, something is lost. Something is lost somewhere. I don't know whether it's the media, the cell phones, the, the computers, or whatever. But something is missing. There, there's a little piece of edge, like your, your daughter and my daughter... My daughter was the kind of person that, that she said, well, you know, Dad, I, I really, I think I want to go to college. I said, no, you don't want to go to college. At the time, I taught her, because I, I did computers, that I taught her how to, you know, do some coding and things like that. She liked to make games, you know, the games you put on a computer. And she made her own discs and everything else. Now, she was good, though. She picked it up, bam, like that. So I said, let me send you to this school that I know. And I sent it to a computer school, all kinds of data stuff, everything from lasers to, to computers to the whole nine yards. She's now making, <laughs> yeah, yeah. she's making ugly money right now. Yeah. Let me tell you, Un, she's, she's, uh, let me see. It was about, uh, six months ago, five months ago. She was made vice first woman, vice president of her company. Congratulations. They, they take care of the Navy the Army, the Marines, and other bigger companies like the Amazons and everything else in that with all their computer needs and laser needs. I mean, they, they can actually, they have a laser that actually counts the pills to go in a bottle. I, I thought that was so cool. I mean, you can put a billion pills through a thing, and this machine will put a, like 100 pills in a, in a bottle. And they're, they're as big as the tip of my finger. Go figure that one out. And she knows how they work and everything else. These are kids that had the chance, that took the chance, that made the jump to whatever they wanted to do. And by what you're talking about on a show like this and the doctor, you guys are telling people, hey, it's still possible. We live through it. You can live through it. And by telling them that, I think maybe they'll learn. Well, I, I I hope they I hope they will. Uh, yeah. It uh, everything has up and a down to it. There's nothing that's straight up. Uh, the the rhythm of the earth is you know the the tide comes in, the tide goes out. You got mountains, you got valleys. So that's just the way the planet is. You're part of the universe. You're part of the ebb and the flow of the universe. And once you get that in your head, you can you can accomplish tremendous things because you can figure out. Well, I know I'm down now, but I know I'm going to be going up tomorrow. This is the problem for right now, but tomorrow I won't even remember. Maybe. So those are the kinds of things that you put into your head that allow you to succeed and not being afraid of change, because I think that's one of the biggest things that hold people back. They're afraid of change because change is always difficult. Oh, yeah. And again, uh, and the doctor knows because I say it all the time and that the people who love themselves have the guts to live and love the rest of the world. Yep. It's easy then. And once you do that, you won. Yeah. I don't care whether you say yeah, up, down, sideways, whatever. Right. No, no. If you can respect and love the whole world, everyone in it, no matter who, who, who or what they are, you won. That's 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 a, is my favorite word. Respect it is one of the, the big ones. Love and respect those two. You, they, you get, it'll get you a lot of, a lot down the road of life. Those two, love and respect. Because my my mom taught me that you know if you if you hate somebody, it comes back and you're eating away at your own self, who you are, it, because it takes from you. Love gives to you. So, I mean, I had a lot of little pebbles that I was taught that, hey, you know, a lot of times we don't teach kids the little, the little things in life that can take them a long way. And to listen to the elder, and I think that's something that's missing. Young people don't listen to older people. And uh, the, the older people have the experience of the years. And, <laughs> right. and they, can, they can impart a lot of knowledge on a young person if they, that's what I did. 
I mm-hmm. listened to my grandmother, my mother, my aunts, my uncles, and I figured they knew more than me. They're older than me, so maybe I ought to listen to what they got to say. I do it. I do it every day, every morning from about, oh, I, I see people usually between about 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning till about 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And there are, there are people who are 28, 30, uh, 18, uh, and they're all, they're, they're memorized, uh, mesmerized, put it that way. They just sit there with their mouths open. They'll ask me questions and I'll give them, like you, a story. You don't have to give it, you don't have to give them an answer in one word. Like I, if somebody gave me a big question and I turned around and said, yes, I'd, I'd kick myself in the butt, mm-hmm. but. On the other hand, Ned, if I can tell them why they asked me that question and then feed it back to them, now you're a teacher. Yeah. You know, you're teaching them questions are a good thing. The more you question, the more you learn. The more you learn, the bigger you get in your life. Yeah. And the more you know, the more you know it is to know. And Damn. you never know everything. Yes, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. Sure. Now, where can, we, where can we get in touch with you? Okay, you can, uh, folks, if they want to buy my book, you can get my book at voidbooks.net. B O Y D B O O K S dot net. Uh, and uh, it's on Amazon and some of the other, uh, you know, Bond and Nobles. It's, it's, a, it's a series of books, and it takes you, like I say, from the year 19. Uh, 25, because she was eight and 25. And my aunt, it's about my aunt, who went from the cotton fields of Mississippi, money Mississippi, to a millionaire. And she owned several apartment buildings in Chicago, Illinois, when she died in 2009. And uh, she she raised me. So I had all kind of an extended family. Wow. So it, it'll, it, you'll be, if you like history, if you like uh, family stories about a family, you, you, you should love the book in and, and the book uh, uh the first two books have been award-winning books so it's not just me saying that there's other folks uh validating that the books are good and there's some talk even of doing this story on the screen big screen or play i've been approached to, to, to think about that so uh, you know life takes me where i'm going I'm, I'm flying as long as god lets me do it hey, your teaching will just expand from those books yeah, well, they they cover religion. They talk about a lot, and you know, they talk about politics a little bit. They talk about religion. They talk about cultures. They talk about traveling. All I tried to weave everything into those books. I mean, music. There's music of the time. But I'm talking about 1957. There's a little thing in there about Sputnik. You know, that's, <laughs> that was the year that Sputnik was shot up in the world. I mean, because my histor- historical knowledge, I can weave all those little strands together. You know, you said about Sputnik, right? My father and I were out on my front lawn of our home, looking up in the air, tracking the Sputnik. We could see it. You could see it move across the sky. So you see, there's the, we're old. Nah, we're not old. We're not just, a, but on that, that scared, yeah. that scared <laughs> the United States to death for a while. Uh, you know, we, I remember all of that. You know, yep. everybody but, was building their their uh, what's his their uh, bomb shelters. Yeah, bomb and, shelters. Oh, yeah. You know, duck and cover. I remember duck and cover and all, all that stuff. Oh. Going way back, the atom bomb was going to fall tomorrow. Because uh-huh. Yeah, the well, the day after. Yeah. And, so, doctor, doctor, where, where could we find you? Oh, uh, uh, my, my website, drrandallgeorge.com, or email me. Uh, and I, I like this one. I've got two, but uh, uh, it's mirabelle.nozawa at gmail.com. M I R A B E L L E dot N O Z A W A at gmail dot com. Contact me. Let's talk. And just to the listeners, all of this information plus Sylvester Boyd Jr.'s information will be on the bottom, right under the YouTube. And that tomorrow that'll be up on that in the Pyramid One radio channel on YouTube. And it'll be kind of cool. And you gentlemen that will have a copy of your show tonight hmm. thank you download it and go for it but i will send everybody in that copies if anybody wants a copy and for some reason they can't find it or they don't know where to go or they want more information or they want more information about the guest write me bob charles show at live.com l-i-v-e or 
Pyramid One Radio at AOL.com. Either one of those networks, I will write and I will send you anything you ask. Gentlemen, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note, I know Sylvester Sidney. Sylvester Sidney, there it is going, what's he going to say? <laughs> Listen, it's a big world. We have a God. You can say, Amen. As I always say, God bless y'all. Bob Charles.